Good evening. As Director of Liturgy of the Basilica of the National Shrine of the Immaculate Conception, it is my pleasure to welcome you on behalf of Monsignor Walter Rossi, the Rector of the Basilica, to a special Lenten reflection this evening given by Mrs. Suzanne Tanzi. Suzanne is the Media and Promotions Manager at Theological College, the National Seminary of the Catholic University of America. Hailing from New England, she came to the Washington area first at George Washington University. As a contributing writer for Magnificat, she has been in Catholic journalism as a managing editor and writer for over 30 years. She is a mother of five children, two of whom are religious sisters. This is particularly poignant for us as her topic this evening is faith and family, practicing gratitude. Please join me in welcoming Mrs. Suzanne Tanzi. Thank you, Father Mal, and for everybody for being here. Um, this will be decidedly the non-theological reflection of the series. Um, I wanted to focus on um, this aspect of gratitude during Lent, because um, last week I was at a retreat and the priest said, Lent is an invitation to welcome the depth of God's infinite love. We are called to experience this liberation and joy so we can announce it. And this idea, often during Lent, I think we have you know, certainly a penitential spirit and maybe even a little bit of a downer having to think about, maybe I have to give up this and that. And, and when I heard this invitation to joyful liberation, um, my mind immediately went to experience I've had of gratitude for God. And it's not something to celebrate outside of Easter, but there's a connection between, let's say, sacrifice or privation and this experience of gratitude. And I wanted to share a little bit through family vignettes to talk about what is this, um, what is its connection to sacrifice, maybe some reminders or inspirations, and um, you know, an obstacle or two that we might hit. Um, like I said, I'm no expert, but um, I have, uh, and I also think this practice of gratitude has come into common parlance. Um, I know this because a year or two ago, I got a message from my health insurance provider outlining certain things I needed to do to be healthier, and top on the list was practice gratitude. There wasn't a lot of instructions about this. Um, but when I saw it on my son, uh, my 70 year old son's whiteboard, practice of gratitude under his workout ethic, I thought, okay, this is not what I'm talking about. <laughs> I mean, practice of gratitude certainly is healthy and good, especially in the youth, but I'm very specifically talking about thanks to God. And um, I'll give an example. About 20 years ago, we moved here from um, New York City, where things were going great. We had four kids. My husband's career was going well. I was freelancing. But we had an opportunity to make an investment in a business here in the area, um, decidedly ex a successful one. And we went ahead with that. We brought our golden nest egg here, and this was going to be it. Um, within two years, I was, I was expecting baby number five. And um, the the business was an architectural millwork place, and um, behind the building there were some propane tanks where some people from a different business were smoking. It basically caused a huge conflagration, and it, bas and it destroyed our business and pretty much our entire life's investment. So at that time, um, I found myself showing up at adoration. It's kind of predictable, I guess. Like Father said during the homily, we want this and this and this, and we don't know where else to ask except for to God. And there were a lot of things I was praying for, not only for my family, but for the other partner and the needs of my kids and our new house, so forth. And in the midst of this, just very private time with God, I was really overcome by the experience of gratitude. I can't describe it any other way. I was just, oh, thank you, God. I just started saying thank you. And 
I had to correct myself and say, stop doing that. You have to pray for so-and-so and this and this and this. You know, get back on track. And finally, I just gave in to this, um, this grace and experience that was delivered to me. Um, and it, it was really the first time in my life where we, we talk about the cross and the crown. You know, the cross leads to the crown, but tomorrow's Monday morning. Um, but it was my first experience of really knowing it for my own life. And um, it just, that grace and gratitude come through privation or sacrifice or penance. It was not something I had really grasped yet. And um, the Greek word for grace is charis. Its basic idea is simply non-meritorious or unearned favor, an unearned gift, a favor or blessing bestowed as a gift freely and never as merit for work performed. And of course, we know that's true with the cross. Um, when we think about you know, our own life, the, the grace that we receive is not earned. Like we think we need to do things, it's just given, like it was given to me that day in such clarity. Um, it's just, it's like a liberating wonder that, you know, you want to try and revisit, but you just need to keep going on with your life knowing that he's made his presence known. Um, and I, here on campus, I work at, as he said, I work for a theological college, which by the way is Father Mel's alma mater. Um, but some of my friends at Catholic U just recently, this past week or two, have told me some stories that sort of reflect this reality. Um, one is a, a friend that works in the, the business school. He suddenly um, had a, kind of a perfect storm of bad health circumstances line up, and he lost his sight. Uh, he's, got, he's got six kids, perfectly healthy. Um, and I sat with him the other day, and he said, I said, tell me you know, what's happened. I saw him at an event on campus, and he said, I have only two things to say. I have two fantastic gifts. One is 25% vision in one eye, and the other is I can actually read one line at a time. And coming from, I'm a huge reader, I read at least two or three books a month, and I was just blown, and they are too, that's part of our connection, and I was just so blown away by his, relating to me his experience of gratitude, it wasn't, I was totally genuine. And then um, I, there's somebody else that works on campus that last year, um, lost a grandchild to a, a freak accident, basically, a four-year-old um, girl. And I'm in a book club with the wife, and she talks a lot about the grace and the gift of the loss that they experienced. Even in their grief, they're not celebrating um, this tragedy, but they're celebrating the presence of God in it. And I'm very moved by this person in particular. I have grandchildren as well. and. She, every time I see her, talks about a new grace that her granddaughter has brought into the family. Yes, prayers answered, but met much of unexpected, and it kind of reminds me of um, Francis Thompson in The Hound of Heaven says, Is my gloom, after all, shade of his hand, outstretched caressingly? So it just makes me think more about what is sacrifice, especially in light of the fact that it actually might be the shade of his hand caressing us. Um, you know, I know that we know that privation, including during Lent, is an invitation to enter more deeply into our relationship with Christ. And I found this, like I said, in these examples, it's especially when we accept a sacrifice that's being asked of us that we did not plan or desire. Um, somehow, like these people have described to me, less has become more. And this is a miracle and a sign. Uh, it's all to me, it's an, we've heard this before too in Lent, it's an invitation to take on a new form. Um, as my family after that incident took on a new form, um, even in practical ways, like my kids got part-time jobs. And we started to share more with them about what was actually going on with us as parents and adults. Not because they needed to take on a burden, but because they were part of our life. And we realized it's not the end of the world to lose everything. Um, everything we thought was everything. Um, so, you know, because we have so many plans, we have plans for a new job, a new house, plans to have a house full of grandchildren, plans to have a life that is free of inconveniences and especially tragedies. 
Um, but it's almost like in taking on that sort of forge ahead stance, we don't want to become new forms. We don't want to be reformed. We want what we want. But as St. Therese of Lisieux said, your life is your ship. It's not your home. And the life, this life in Christ is bringing us to our eternal home. And it does require us to take on a new form. Um, I'm powerfully reminded of this connection between sacrifice and gift by the life choice of my two daughters. As Father Mel mentioned, they both at a young age decided to enter religious life. Um, and similarly to my experience in front of that experience of gratitude was irresistible. And they found also in adoration this revelation of the gift of himself. And they found that irresistible. Um, it was really a choice. Their choices were motivated by a profound gratitude towards God. And a lot of that's a mystery that I don't understand and they probably can't explain it either. But um, I was also invited into the sacrifice of their lives to the religious life. You know, for a parents a little different, I wasn't super excited about it initially. I mean, I, one of them lives in Rome. She's with the Missionary Sisters of St. Charles Borromeo. And so I only see her every two years. Not, neither of them are home for any holidays, religious holidays, and they only can call at certain times and so forth. So I found this privation pretty brutal at first. Um, but so my husband said, you can't complain about the in-laws. And he's right about that. They are very happily married. <laughs> um, even to the point just in conversations that we have, um, you know, Kiara just said to me one day, you know, I wake up and I can't believe that this is my life, that these are my friends, and this is my community. She's just non-thinking, not thinking about it. This is how she wakes up, which is a very pure moment, as you know, when you wake up. Um, and then my daughter Isabella is with the Sisters of Life, which you're probably more familiar with because they're in the neighborhood. And um, they're very sunny disposition-wise, but they, th those ladies go into some very dark places. Um, they um, work with many, many people. The majority of people have mental illness. And um, there too, how can I be sad when she says, yes, I know, we do fast. We do have to help people that almost seem hopeless, but I've never been happier. So this is a miracle that I can't explain, but I just think during Lent, let's look at these things again and, and revisit our own position in front of them while we're scrambling around trying to get what we want. Instead, like this uh, abandonment uh, brings so much uh, fruit. And I was speaking about being reformed, um, one of the girls wrote something for her order's newsletter that she didn't even tell me about. I just came across it because my older daughter is in uh, formation, so she um, is in charge of, or she accompanies the simple professed, which is the first step towards being final professed. And she just wrote a little reflection saying, each time we are struck by the luminous beauty of the newly professed, being in formation means starting to take a new form, that of Christ, letting our life conform to him, discovering that our deepest identity is belonging fully to God and to our community of the church. So this is the form that we're all called to. And, you know, I take her, her keyword that she sees the luminous beauty of it. And again, you know, if someone's in religious life, they do have a lot more time to reflect and pray. Some, they get up at five in the morning and usually pray for at least an hour or two. And um, so, you know, don't blame yourself if you're not reflecting as much because you might not have the time, but um, these are things that are making my memory uh, alive. And talking about the new forms, not everybody's called to religious life, so what does that mean for lay people or married people? And um, I like this, um, this outline from Carol Hauslander. She says there's three forms. First form is the reed crafted into the lute, because you, you probably know that she calls Mary the reed of God. She's the voice, she's um, praise, gratitude. First form is the us as the reed of God. The second form is the chalice, the sacrificial wine. Anybody who has kids knows what this means. And then the nest for nurturing growth. And we 
whether parents or not, we're all these things as Christians. And I noted to myself too, like the form changes is where we have to be open to the form changing, like the nest, the third point that she makes about our form. Our nest has changed. My kids are grown. So I have one in college, but I, um, I have two exchange students from China now. That's my nest. Um, and it kind of happened not with me going out of my way, let's put it that way. Um, but now, and uh, one of them has been with us for almost four years, and uh, they're coming from communist China, and that's my nest. Um, but we're going to be celebrating a baptism of one of them soon. So that's, that's the fruit of giving. Again, I didn't do anything for that. I just offered the place. And they heard and saw some things, and one of them was excited. Finally this year, he said he discovered Christ. Um, and then I want to say one more thing about that on sacrifice that Carol Hauslander brought up. The fact of spending ourselves for another always generates a new life in us. So it's not just generating the new life for the exchange student or supporting your children when they, they make their choices. Um, it, the, to give life is the purpose of love and it causes new shoots of green life to grow in us. I'm bringing this up again because I think we ignore our own growth and the observation of it and um, the, the gratitude that will come with knowing that. Um, so taking on a new form is obviously a goal of Lent, um, but it leaves, us in one, it leaves us in so much wonder, like I was describing, yet, you know, we still go on our way. And I was thinking about, um, Last week or so, I stopped. I, once a week, I try and visit my grandkids, uh, my daughter's children, after work. But it's like an hour and a half to get there. So I went anyways. But I went uh, on purpose during their nap um, because they were really sick. Like they were too sick to have visitors. But I left some gifts and I talked to my daughter for a bit. And when I heard them waking, I, I disappeared. But she told me later that when her son got up, he saw the treats and the gifts to cheer them up. But he heard that I was there and he just started crying. He couldn't believe he missed me. It's like, he, they love when we come, but I don't, I don't think about that. I just, you know, how many times, basically it made me stop and think, how many times do I see the signs of his presence and acknowledge the gift that he has left, but I don't miss him. I don't think of him. I take the treat and run. And, um, you know, it's partly, again, a condition of life that I'm in, but I, I lack, or I would like to find, especially during Lent, rediscover that childlike um, attitude that my grandson has. Like, Grammy was here, like, I don't care about this stuff. He did actually get distracted by the treats, but um, he just, he taught me a lesson that day. You know, why am I always so programmatic about my sacrifices and not really looking at looking for the one that I'm seeking, you know, if that makes sense. Um, another example of that is, you know, I was praying, we have some pretty intense petitions sometimes, and I had one that I really needed to um, fit in praying for during the day, and I still had some cooking projects to do, so I'm like, I'm going to do these things automatically, and I'm going to pray for this person and this thing. And, um, you know, I started like that, but I thought suddenly something's wrong with this. And I left the kitchen, turned everything off, and I went in the study, nobody was there. And I just started praying there for the thing I needed to pray for. And looking around that room, we have pictures of things that, places we used to live but don't live anymore, people we used to know but have left us, family pictures. And you know, in that moment, I had a similar experience of gratitude where I just let the grace you know, of his happiness with me and his celebration of my life and to end just being there in his presence. And so then the petition that I had, which like I said, was you know, pretty desperate. It wasn't dwarfed by, oh, I'm, I'm so grateful now. It was actually, it was lifted in this milieu of gratitude. It became so, something of hope and um, mercy, if you want. These are just examples of my life. Um, you know, sometimes abandoning the busyness of the kitchen is the best thing you could do. Um, you know, there's, I'm helped a lot by these examples. I'm giving you very 
these are probably really banal examples for you because it's not, you're not familiar with my life and maybe they're boring, but there's a book called Power and Praise. It's an old book by um, Merlin Carruthers. It's kind of dated language wise, but the whole book, he had also wrote a book on prison ministry. The whole book is about these kind of stories. So if you, if you need to build your memory of his grace through other people's experience viscerally, this is a really um, helpful book. It basically is talking about the daily practice of, of praise and the fruit that it brings. And sometimes it is intentional, you know, and sometimes things happen to us that we don't want. And so the praise comes anyway, like I told you. Um, the one thing, I, final thing I want to say about this experience is I have a big obstacle, um, which is, you know, one of the aspects of gratitude that eludes me, and I think many of us, is thankfulness for myself, like for my being. I'm like, even, I told you the story about my grandson crying because I wasn't there. I just couldn't believe it. I'm like, what? Why didn't he go for the gifts? You know, it's, it's um, you know, maybe this is because as a parent, you know, I'm always aware of all the failures, the things I haven't done over, like, so many years and I don't let myself be embraced by the love that is there and that is really the starting point of all this gratitude I need to sort of back off myself a little it's kind of the imposter syndrome and not give in to the lie you know because I, I do have friends that struggle with this much more than I do and um, it, it is absolutely against the fact that God chose you and his evidence is everywhere um, so that's just a vanity that I would just caution people that I'm working on to um, just kind of a joke on that end. A couple of weeks ago, I was writing um, thank you letters for the rector, for the donors of the seminary, which is a really important thing. Um, he, he vetted them, and I would put in a quote from a saint of the day or whatever. We worked on it together, but I was kind of surprised when I received um, the same letter in the mail to myself because I'm a donor. So I basically wrote a thank you letter to myself, <laughs> and I thought, well, you know, why not? Like, that, that's something. You know, I'm going to thank myself today. And, you know, that's God's celebration of our being. He's our best friend, our closest companion, and the one that we're anyway striving to conform ourselves to, to change our form toward. But love of self through his inspiration, I think, is really key to this whole process and important to me in this reflection. Thank you.